morning and welcome to Padok Methodist Church's 8.30 a.m. service. A warm welcome to those joining us via live cast as well. As we come to our Father this morning, seeking Him to be the King of our lives, let us take some time to reflect on all His wondrous creations. May they inspire and remind us that He Join us in our opening day. Church, now let us pray. Almighty God, 
indeed I also sing how great thou art. Heaven is your throne and the earth is your footstool. Everything that is was made by your hands. And so they come into being. The heavenly hosts praise you and your congregation here on earth blesses your holy name. Let us, your church, not forget all of your benefits, you who forgive all our sin, who heal all our diseases, who, who redeems our life from the pit, who crowns us in your steadfast love and mercy. You, O oh Lord, do deeds of justice for the oppressed. You are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in loyal love. First, the heavens are high above the earth, so your loyal love prevail over those who fear you. And as far as the east is from the west, so you have removed far from us the guilt of our transgressions. You, O Lord, know that we are dust. Our days are like the grass, and we are no more. But your love is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear you. And so now we lift up prayers for our world, our nation, and our church. Lord, we pray for the many people in Asia who are affected by the heat wave in the recent weeks. For the people in India who are turning up for their general elections this month. We pray for farmers whose livelihood depend on the weather for healthy crops. We also pray for those who need to work in these hot conditions like the food delivery workers and construction workers. We pray for Singapore. We thank you, Lord, for Labor Day and for the rest that we enjoy. But we look forward to the rest that you promise. We also thank you for the many years of service for our Prime Minister, Lee Hsien Long. And we pray for the many individuals that are handling the transitions during this handover period. We also want to pray for our Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong, our ministers and those working in the government, knowing that they have been instituted by you a lot. We also want to pray for our church. We, pray, we thank you so much for the construction workers who are renovating our, our rooms. We ask that you protect them during their work, especially from heat injuries. We also want to commit the Mission Summit to your hands. We pray for the speakers and the people involved in one way or another. And Lord, would you give us an open heart for your mission to the world. Church, let us now unite our voices and pray together the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Bring you greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A warm welcome to all of you to our 8.30 a.m. service. Um, this morning, I just want to say that, you know, uh, that Pastor Aaron, he's, he's uh, away at U in the UK, for those of you who don't know. He's uh, there with track president and a group of pastors attending the Alpha Conference and also doing a Methodist uh, heritage um, tour. And so do keep him in prayer as he will be there for uh, two weeks. And fortunately for myself, uh, even though I'm the only pastor here, but I'm not alone because today, Communion Sunday also, we have Pastor Lawrence Chua who will be leading us, so I'm really thankful for that. And um, at this point in time, we want to take this time also especially to welcome those of you, if this is your first time joining us at worship, uh, we want to acknowledge you and welcome you. Anyone, if I'm wondering, if this is your first time here, you could just raise your hand or wave and we'd like to acknowledge you. Anybody? I don't think I see any hands. Okay, if not, then can I ask if we could stand to our feet, let's go around to bless each other, welcome each other with the peace of Christ.
I've got a number of family news to share with us this morning. So the first of which is um, there is an altar ministry equipping that is taking place on the 18th of May. And so um, I'd like to encourage us to sign up for this. This is going to take place in church, uh, on venue, on site. So it's going to be held at the prayer room from the 9th to 12th, uh, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. All right, so you can scan the QR code to register or to also find out more about uh, more information about it. The next thing that I'd like to share with us is regarding our BMC app. And so you know that um, we have been using Oikos for a while now and we had been having problems with it. And we are excited to share that we will soon be having our very own BMC mobile application, which is developed and maintained in-house. All right. And, and uh, it is developed by our own people. Huh? So I must really say that our thank we, we are really thankful that uh, BMC family is really a talented and gifted family. We have app developers. Uh, the Oikos app has helped us transit from the physical bulletin to a to digital bulletin. So now we no longer have uh, physical bulletins. It was good, but however, we had it has limitations because it was developed by uh, third parties. Now this new mobile app will be a one-stop digital platform for all BMC worshippers and also visitors to connect with our church. You, on the app, you will be able to find news on upcoming activities, sermons, resources, uh, discussion questions, reflection questions, and this app will serve all age groups. The idea is for this new app to be your go-to on a daily basis to stay in touch with BMC. All right, so this will be out soon, so stay tuned for more information on how to download this new app uh, on the 30th of June. All right. Now, next, I'd like to share with us, uh, as we begin this new month in May, uh, we're going to be collecting our second offering for WSCS Sunday. Right? So, um, this month, if you'd like to give the second offering to this course, please quote WSCS Sunday when you give uh, electronically. All right? If not, if, when you, if, if you give physically, the, the, box, the offering boxes are at the exit points. You can place your offerings over there. Now, lastly, our sister church, Aldersgate Methodist Church, is celebrating their 45th anniversary today. And so we want to celebrate with them and to honour uh, what God has been doing in Aldersgate Methodist Church, which is in the Fairfield Methodist Schools, right? They're located at Dover. All right, so with that, uh, I'll leave the rest of the announcements to, uh, you know, your own prayer, participation, and... Let us now prepare our hearts as we prepare to give to God through our tithes and offerings. And let's pray also for our gate as we pray together. Join me in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we come with grateful hearts and we just want to give you thanks and firstly pray for Aldersgate Methodist Church that as they celebrate, Lord, their 45th anniversary, we just want to pray, Father, for your continued blessings to be upon them. We thank you, Father, for the work that they do, uh, in the schools, in both Fairfield Methodist primary and secondary. I pray they continue to uh, do that wonderful work in, in, in plowing into the lives of the students there. I pray for the leaders and the pastors that you continue to guide them and journey with them, granting them your wisdom and your strength. And for us as a church, uh, even as we continue to worship you, Lord, through giving of our tithes and offerings, we pray that, Lord, uh, you... You use these gifts, these tithes and offerings for the work of your kingdom. As we give, Lord, help us to give uh, out of a cheerful heart that, Lord, you teach us to be content with what you have given to us and provided for us. And so, Lord, we commit this to you, we worship you, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
for the doxology. Church this morning, our speaker, uh, Mr. Daniel Ko, he um, may not be familiar to many of you, but actually he's no stranger to our church because he has been uh, interning with us for quite a while now. Uh, Mr. Daniel Ko is a second year student studying in TTC, and he's currently an intern as part of his D, uh, Ministry of Divi uh, Masters of Divinity program and has been with us since July last year. Prior to his internship with BMC, he was worshipping at Pentecost Methodist Church before going into full-time ministry with a small church called At The Well. Now, so we are privileged to have him bring us God's word, and so may I ask if you could join me in welcoming him. Morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's good, yeah, it's good to see all of you here. It's good to get a response as well. Um, so at this time, let me read out the selected portions of Ruth chapter 3 to 4 this morning. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you, where you'll be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose woman you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight, he'll be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, know the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? He asked. I am your servant Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garments over me since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than what you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Chapter 4, verse 13. So Boaz told Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to your word today to learn from the past, to live in the present, and to hope for the future. Anoint my lips as I preach forth your word. Amen. There was a movie that came out in 2017 called Baby Driver. The protagonist is a young man called Baby, and he was the getaway driver for a group of robbers. He agreed to the role of the getaway driver because he needed to pay off his debts. Throughout the movie, I found myself rooting for him, even though I knew that what he was doing was wrong. 
I was hoping that he would be able to escape the circumstances that he was in. And this is how I feel about the text in Ruth. I am rooting for Naomi and Ruth to leave the tragic circumstances that they are in. But at the same time, I can't help but feel uncomfortable with what happened in Ruth chapter 3. If we examine the passage <clears throat> in Ruth chapter 3, verse 1 to 8, what happens here is scandalous. Naomi wants to secure a good future for Ruth and herself. So she asks Ruth to wash herself, put on perfume, and dress well before going down to the threshing floor and lie down beside Boaz and uncover his feet. To put it mildly, Naomi seems to be asking Ruth to make herself as attractive as possible so that Ruth will be attracted to her and thus marry her. This passage also includes several other questionable elements which require further examination. In olden Jewish times, to go down to the threshing floor at night was to act inappropriately. So let me quote Bishop Gordon Wong on this. It is not the sort of place respectable girls go to at night. In fact, in those days, the threshing floor at night was where harlots would go to ply their trade. Knowing this, going down to the threshing floor at night certainly seems dodgy. And unfortunately, it doesn't end here. In verse 4, Naomi asks Ruth to uncover Boaz's feet, which Ruth does in verse 7. Now, the word feet in ancient times had a second meaning. Let me once again quote Bishop Gordon on, on this. In biblical Hebrew, the word feet was also used as a polite way to re refer to one's private parts. Now, I don't think I need to explain what the implied meaning of uncovering Boaz's feet here. And now that we know all this, how do we make sense of this passage? Now, first of all, let me state that even though this advice from Naomi was questionable, I don't think that Naomi was out to sabo Ruth. I think that Naomi was a good mother-in-law, and she genuinely had Ruth's best interest at heart. After all, Naomi was seen to be concerned with Ruth's well-being in chapter 2. So how should we read these texts? Now, have you ever heard the phrase, the biblical text is descriptive but not prescriptive? Meaning that the Bible text is telling us what happened and not telling us what we should do. If a text is prescriptive, then it is telling us what we should do. So a good example of this would be the Ten Commandments, where God tells his people how they should live in relation to him and to each other. If a text is descriptive, it is just telling us what happened and not asking us to follow the example. We see this in the Gospel of Matthew, where Judas hangs himself out of guilt. The biblical text is not asking us to kill ourselves when we do something wrong and feel guilty. Rather, it is telling us what happened. So today's text is a good example of a descriptive text. The text is describing the events that is happening between Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz but it is not telling us that we should do as Naomi and Ruth did. In fact, the text is telling us of the goodness of God despite the actions of Naomi and Ruth. And this is how the Israelites would have understood this passage. And this is also a lesson for us. Just because the outcome turns out well, it doesn't mean that God approves of the actions. To think that God approves of our actions if the actions go our way it's the scandal of thinking that the end justifies the means. What Naomi wanted for Ruth is good, but how she and Ruth went about it was not so good. A better way could have been for Naomi to approach Boaz in the day to play the role of matchmaker between Boaz and Ruth. I believe the outcome would still have been the same and Boaz would still have married Ruth. But Naomi and Ruth chose otherwise. And he was fortunate that everything turned out well. Sometimes in the process of wanting a good outcome, we don't do things the right way. And I saw this play out when I was still working in HR before I entered full-time ministry. There was a department of two people that reported to the general manager. One was very capable at her job and the other was merely competent, not amazing. In order to make herself look better in front of the general manager, the capable worker would put down the competent worker and would often highlight the feelings of the competent worker. 
the capable worker did end up with a bigger bonus and a bigger increment, and she definitely had the favour of the general manager. The outcome for her was good. But how she came to achieve it was wrong. She stepped on her colleague to make herself look better, and I would like to suggest that doing this was unnecessary. She was a capable person, and there was no need for her to put her colleague down to receive the bigger bonus and increment. The fact that she received her boss's favour did not mean that her actions towards her colleague were right. The ends do not justify the means. Next, we come to the interaction between Boaz and Ruth at the threshing floor. Let us read through this section again. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? He asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. You know, this could have easily become a scandalous incident if Boaz had chosen to exert his rights. When Boaz woke up and found out that it was Ruth beside him, there were three actions that he could have taken. The first, the first was that he could have exerted his rights and taken advantage of Ruth. I mean, it was Ruth who came to him in the middle of the night. It was Ruth who uncovered his feet. Boaz could have easily taken advantage of the situation and of Ruth and had intimate relations with her. He could justify that he would take responsibility for his actions afterwards. But Boaz did not choose this option. Um, when I was in lower primary, um, I became friends with a girl in my class who always bought me food. She would also buy food for some other classmates as well. So at recess time, we would go down to the canteen and she would ask us, what do you want to eat? I buy for you. So I would say, I want chicken nugget or I want ice cream. And she would buy that for me. A few weeks later, her mother came to school and very angrily complained to the form teacher that the girl was spending all her pocket money and kept asking her for more money because she felt she was obliged to buy her friend's food. So her mother asked the form, teacher, form teacher to put a stop to this. It was at this moment that I realized that this girl was buying us food as a way to make friends with us. And I had taken advantage of her kindness by always asking her to buy food for me at recess time. I had not bothered asking her why she was buying me food or if she had the financial abilities to buy me food. I was just happy that I had free food. <laughs> I mean, I regret that now and I wish I had not acted in the way I did and be more like Boaz, who did not take advantage of the situation that he was in. The second thing that Boaz could have done was to exert his rights in casting Ruth away from him in righteous anger. He could have harshly questioned Ruth about the manner in which she approached him and cast doubts on her character. In doing so, he would have shamed and disgraced Ruth. But Boaz did not choose to do this. And I think that this behavior that Boaz exhibited not to condemn and dismiss Ruth is something that we can really learn from. It is not too difficult to imagine a situation where we find ourselves condemning someone who may be engaging in an act we don't agree with. This is even more prevalent in our hyper-connected digital society, where videos are taken and uploaded and people are able to comment on them. A few weeks ago, while queuing up to enter the Bruno Mars concert, this is not Taylor Swift, this is Bruno Mars, an Indonesian influencer was filmed spitting on a Singaporean concert goer. And this video was uploaded onto TikTok and gathered more than 5 million views. There were many comments on the videos, and some of them were harsh, asking the Singaporean to report to the police as she was assaulted by the influencer Spit. Now Spit also can be an assault. While other comments were downright toxic, making unflattering comments about the influencer's body 
and nationality. While these keyboard warriors may have the right to make these comments, these comments were certainly not helpful, but hurtful. I would like to encourage us to think instead on how we can be more gracious with the words that we use. And this brings me to the third course of action which Boaz could have taken, which was to put aside his rights and respond in kindness to Ruth. And this was what Boaz chose to do. Despite the reckless and somewhat questionable way Ruth came to Boaz at the threshing floor, when Ruth asked Boaz to help her and redeem her, Boaz listened. And then Boaz responded in kindness. From verses 10 to 11, the Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you, that you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. First, Boaz greeted Ruth with a blessing. This is a very comforting thing to say to someone when they are in distress. When you say, the Lord bless you to someone, you are wishing them well. And they also receive the blessing and the hope that they too may be blessed by God. Next, Boaz recognized the motivation behind Ruth's actions. In not going after young men, Boaz acknowledged that Ruth could have tried to find somebody else to remarry, but she had chosen not to, so that she could be with Naomi. It was clear that Ruth was doing what she was doing out of love for Naomi, for she had placed Naomi's well-being above her own. And then, Boaz addressed the request of Ruth that he was willing to do what Ruth had asked of him. It would have been very disappointing if Boaz had said, the Lord bless you, I see your intentions, but I cannot help you. And sometimes we can be guilty of this. When someone approaches us for help, we acknowledge that there is a problem, but we think that it is too great a cost for us to help. So we say, sorry, but I cannot help you. Fortunately, this didn't happen in the passage. Boaz heard the request of Ruth, and he sought to fulfill it. But that is not all. Boaz could have stopped here after making his promise to Ruth, but he continued in saying, you are a woman of noble character. These were very kind words that Boaz had for Ruth. Remember, Ruth came to Boaz in somewhat dubious circumstances. Boaz knew this and cared to restore Ruth, Ruth wasn't some harlot who came to seek Boaz at the threshing floor. She was a worthy woman, a dutiful daughter-in-law, and diligent in her work. Boaz wanted to let Ruth know that her character had not been tarnished in his sight. The kind words that we speak can give life and dignity to others. When we are at a coffee shop and we see the cleaning uncle or auntie cleaning our tables and we thank them for it, which means, thank you so much, uncle, for cleaning our tables. Their eyes brighten a bit at the acknowledgement of the work that they are doing. After we take our grab ride home, we say to the driver, thank you for the drive back. May you have good business today. In doing so, we recognize that the driver sending us home is a person and that there is dignity in the work that they are doing. Kind words are able to lift a person up and restore the innate dignity that God has given them. There is much that we can learn from Boaz. He, he reacted in an exemplary way when he was placed in a difficult situation. I like how Bishop Gordon puts it. Thank God for people like Boaz people who are strong enough to show us grace when most others would shame and condemn us. People who are kind and wise enough to treat us, not simply according to our misdeeds, but according to our motives and circumstances. People who are big enough to embrace some of our mistakes and weaknesses. Where would we be without such people? Indeed, let us strive to be like Boaz. 
And then we come to Ruth chapter 4, where we see the scandal redeemed. The scandal here is not what Ruth and Naomi did the night before. I believe that has been redeemed with the words of kindness that Boaz said. The redemption here refers to the lives of Ruth and Naomi. Remember, in chapter 1, Naomi went to Moab with her husband and two sons to escape famine. But in Moab, she lost her husband and her two sons. And then she came back to Bethlehem after that, exclaiming, Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. But then we come to the end of the book of Ruth, and we see this instead. The woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given, birth, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. There was redemption for Naomi. God gave Naomi a new family and a new life. God is able to restore to her the things that she has lost. Restoration that is not in the form of giving her exactly what she has lost, but in the sense of redeeming the brokenness in her life and giving her a new way forward. Some of us here may be like Naomi coming back from Moab. You may be going through a season of life where you have experienced loss and life is bitter for you. It could be the loss of a loved one, a miscarriage, a dream that has been left unfulfilled. It is difficult to get through each day. You call out to God, but there is no answer. It is the scandal of deep suffering in life. But I want to assure you that there is hope in the Lord. And like Naomi, your life may be redeemed too. So how did Naomi recover her trust in God? Well, she learned to first put her trust in Boaz, who was a conduit for God's grace into her life. And I think Ruth chapter 3 verse 18 is key in showing this trust. Then Naomi said, Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Naomi was speaking from a position of trust in the person of Boaz. But how did Naomi know this? How did Naomi know that Boaz will settle the issue of marriage with Ruth? I think that, I know that Naomi is Ruth's mother-in-law and mother-in-laws are said to have all the answers to life, but I don't think it was the case here. I would like to suggest that Naomi didn't simply rely on her mother-in-law instincts to arrive at her conclusions, but she looked at three things instead. The first thing that she looked at was at Boaz's track record. Boaz allowed Ruth to glean in his fields even though he didn't know Ruth. We see in Ruth chapter 2, verse 20, that in response to Boaz's actions, Naomi exclaimed, the Lord bless him. He has not stopped showing kindness to the, to the living and the dead. So Naomi knew Boaz to be a kind person. Boaz was also involved in the day-to-day -day running of the harvest fields. That was how he was able to recognize that Ruth was a newcomer to his fields. If he didn't appear at the fields often, how would he be able to recognize that Ruth was a newcomer? So Boaz had a good track record in being diligent as well. Hence, Naomi knew Boaz to be both a kind and diligent person. The second thing that Naomi noticed were the actions of Boaz towards Ruth. Besides the kindness shown to Ruth in the harvest fields, she also noted that he did not take advantage of Ruth when she came to him at midnight at the threshing floor. We covered this just now. Boaz could have easily done so. 
but he did not. He did not take advantage of Ruth. So Boaz's actions prove that he was a responsible and kind man. The final thing that Naomi noticed were the words that Boaz said. Boaz told Ruth, and I read from chapter 3, verse 11 onwards, And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. And then Boaz promises Ruth, There is a redeemer nearer than I. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then, as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. So Naomi was not merely relying on her mother-in-law instincts when she told Ruth and Boaz, when she told Ruth that Boaz would not rest, but will settle the matter today. She looked at Boaz's track record, his actions, and his words of promise before coming to that conclusion. I would like to suggest that this is not too different from how we make our judgments today. And I'm going to verbalize one of mine now. You know who Joel is, right? He's the pastoral staff in charge of DGs. So handsome. <laughs> and I want to say that Joel is a responsible man who never hesitates to help those in need. And I'm fortunate to have him as my friend. Now, how am I able to say this? I use my mother-in-law instincts too. All jokes aside, the first thing I looked at was at Joel's track record. Joel is trusted by many people here. If something needs to get done, very often Joel is the one who is approached to get it done. If there is an event held in BMC, he'll be running around in, and helping out in some way. So his track record has shown him to be helpful and reliable. The second thing I looked at were his actions, where he has been open and helpful to me. In the first month of my internship here in BMC, when I didn't know anything that was going on, he was the one who helped me out. When I said I didn't know how the DGs were run in BMC, he came down to TTC to explain the structure and the systems that were in place in BMC. When I needed help in the admin staff regarding my internship, he was willing to help me out as well. So from his actions, I could see that Joel was not only helpful, but he took the initiative to help me out. Finally, I also listen to the words that he speaks. When Joel says, bro, do you need help? I can help you if you need. I believe him. I believe that he can help me and that he wants to help me. And it is in this vein that I would like to commend us to deepen our faith and to trust in God. How can we know that we can trust God? Because of his track record. The God who has been faithful in the lives of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob will be faithful to me, Daniel, to Joel, and to all of you. How can we know that we can trust God? Because of his actions. While we were sinners, Christ died for us so as to reconcile us to him. How can we know that we can trust God? Because of his words. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. This is how we know we can trust God. Brothers and sisters, just as Naomi could put her trust in Boaz to secure her future because of his track record, his actions, and his words, we too can put our trust in God in all matters because we know his track record, his actions, and his words. So let us do so today. One tangible practice that we can do to show that we do indeed place our trust in God is through Holy Communion. Pastor Aaron began this series on Ruth with the fact that Ruth and Naomi lived in the time of judges and that during that time, there was no king and everyone did as they saw fit. Now that we come to the end of the book of Ruth, we see that Ruth gives birth to Obed the ancestor of the greatest king of Israel, David, who is also the ancestor of the saviour of all mankind, Jesus. The book of Ruth was a bridge between the lawlessness of the time of judges and the kingdom of David, which prospered 
under the rule of God. Similarly, we are now living in a time which is a bridge between the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ and his second coming. We express the faith and trust of this reality through the participation of Holy Communion. For when we partake of Holy Communion, it is a declaration that we affirm the track record of God, that he has been faithful throughout human history and will continue to be. We declare the truth and the death of the death and resurrection of Christ, and because of that, we have life eternal. We also believe in the words of Christ that he will return for us. We can live in hope because of that promise. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your hand of providence over Ruth and Naomi, that you have protected them and provided for them in difficult times. We ask that we too may enjoy that same protection and provision in our lives, and that we will learn to fully place our trust in you. May we live the reality of the kingdom of God every day of our lives. Amen. Family, will you please stand and join us in our hymn of dedication, Where Thou Eatest Me. Before we receive the benediction, if any of you here, uh, you are in need of prayer or if uh, you have a prayer concern or need in any way, we'd like to invite you to come forward and we'd like to pray with you and for you. And now I'd like to invite uh, Pastor Lawrence to give us the benediction. You must give a blessing to your fellow worshippers also. Turn to your neighbour, look them in the eye with the word of faith You say, Shalom and the Lord bless you. No, look them in the eye, look at the shadow.
Praise Him and Shalom and the Lord bless you. And the joy of the Lord be your double portion. The word you heard this morning, you have been redeemed. The joy of the Lord be your double portion. God our Father, we thank you that you are a good God. You do not withhold good things from your children. God, we thank you. This morning we enter into the joy of communion with our Lord Jesus Christ. Now as God's people go to the nation to share the love, the peace, and the joy that the Redeemer has brought us. Father, let your blessing flow in double measure. The blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit indeed be multiplied through us to the nation this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you.